Church leaders today are fully conscious of the unlimited access to information. We're making extraordinary efforts to provide accurate context and understanding. A prime example of this effort is the 11 Gospel Topics Essays on LDS.org. It is important that you know the content in these essays like you know the back of your hand. You should be among the first outside your students, families, to introduce authoritative sources on topics that will be less well-known or controversial. So your students will measure whatever they hear or read later against what you have already taught them. Please, before you send them into the world, inoculate your students Inoculate students to inoculate our young people. Joseph told associates that an angel appeared to him three times between 1834 and 1842 and commanded him to proceed with plural marriage when he hesitated to move forward. During the third and final appearance, the angel came with a drawn sword, threatening Joseph with destruction unless he went forward and obeyed the commandment fully. The youngest wife was Helen Mar Kimball, daughter of Joseph's closest friends Heber C. and Violet Murray Kimball, who was sealed to Joseph several months before her 15th birthday. Following his marriage to Louisa Beeman, and before he married other single women, Joseph was sealed to a number of women who were already married. The revelation on marriage required that a wife give her consent before her husband could enter into plural marriage, but Emma likely did not know about all of Joseph's ceilings. Consistent with Joseph Smith's teachings, the church permits a man whose wife has died to be sealed to another woman when he remarries. Careful estimates put the number of Joseph's wives between 30 and 40. Genetic testing has so far been negative, though it is possible he fathered two or three children with plural wives. At the April 1904 General Conference, President Smith issued a forceful statement, known as the Second Manifesto, attaching penalties to entering into plural marriage. Contrary to direction, two apostles, John W. Taylor and Matthias F. Cowley, continued to perform and encourage new plural marriages after the Second Manifesto. They were eventually dropped from the quorum, Taylor was later excommunicated from the church after he insisted on his right to continue to perform plural marriages. Cowley was restricted from using his priesthood, and later admitted that he had been wholly in error. President John Taylor's son, the Apostle John W. Taylor, later reported that he found among his father's papers, after his death, a revelation given him, President Taylor, of the Lord. President Taylor desired to have it, plural marriage, suspended, but the Lord would not permit it to be done. Years later, Apostle Taylor presented a copy of this revelation to the Twelve at his excommunication trial for continuing to perform plural marriages. Joseph Smith and his scribes wrote of two instruments used in translating the Book of Mormon. One instrument, called in the Book of Mormon the Interpreters, is better known to Latter-day Saints today as the Urim and Thummim. The other instrument which Joseph Smith discovered in the ground years before he received the gold plates was a small oval stone or seer stone. As a young man during the 1820s, Joseph Smith, like others in his day, used a seer stone to look for lost objects and buried treasure. As Joseph grew to understand his prophetic calling, he learned that he could use the stone for the higher purpose of translating scripture. Apparently for convenience, Joseph often translated with the single seer stone rather than the two stones bound together to form the interpreters. According to these accounts, Joseph placed either the interpreters or the seer stone in a hat pressed his face into the hat to block out extraneous light, and read aloud English words that appeared on the instrument. Emma described Joseph sitting with his face buried in his hat, with a stone in it, and dictating hour after hour with nothing between us. According to Emma, the plates often lay on the table without any attempt at concealment, wrapped in a small linen tablecloth. Joseph Smith probably possessed more than one seer stone. He appears to have found one of the stones while digging a well in 1822. Joseph did not hide his well-known early involvement in treasure-seeking. In 1838, he published responses to questions frequently asked of him. 
Was not Joe Smith a money digger? One question read. Yes, Joseph answered. But it was never a very profitable job for him, as he only got $14 a month for it. Some have contended that the migrations mentioned in the Book of Mormon did not occur because the majority of DNA identified to date in modern native peoples most closely resembles that of Eastern Asian populations. The evidence assembled to date suggests that the majority of Native Americans carry largely Asian DNA. At the present time, scientific consensus holds that the vast majority of Native Americans belong to sub-branches of the Y-chromosome haplogroups C and Q14, and the mitochondrial DNA haplogroups A, B, C, D, and X, all of which are predominantly East Asian. The 2006 update to the introduction of the Book of Mormon states that Book of Mormon peoples were among the ancestors of the American Indians. The introduction previously stated that the Lamanites were the principal ancestors of the American Indians. For much of its history, from the mid-1800s until 1978, the Church did not ordain black men of African descent to its priesthood, or allow black men or women to participate in the temple endowment or sealing ordinances. During the first two decades of the Church's existence, a few black men were ordained to the priesthood. There is no reliable evidence that any black men were denied the priesthood during Joseph Smith's lifetime. In 1852, President Brigham Young publicly announced that men of black African descent could no longer be ordained to the priesthood. Following the death of Brigham Young, subsequent church presidents restricted blacks from receiving the temple endowment or being married in the temple. Over time, church leaders and members advanced many theories to explain the priesthood and temple restrictions. None of these explanations is accepted today as official doctrine of the church. According to one view, blacks descended from the same lineage as the biblical Cain, who slew his brother Abel. Those who accepted this view believed that God's curse on Cain was the mark of a dark skin. Black servitude was sometimes viewed as a second curse placed upon Noah's grandson Canaan as a result of Ham's indiscretion towards his father. The curse of Cain was often put forward as a justification for the priesthood and temple restrictions. Around the turn of the century, another explanation gained currency. Blacks were said to have been less than fully valiant in the pre-mortal battle against Lucifer, and as a consequence were restricted from priesthood and temple blessings. Today, the church disavows the theories advanced in the past that black skin is a sign of divine disfavor or curse, or that it reflects unrighteous actions in a pre-mortal life that mixed-race marriages are a sin, or that black people or any other race or ethnicity are inferior in any way to anyone else. Church leaders today unequivocally condemn all racism, past and present, in any form. During the 19th century, women frequently blessed the sick by the prayer of faith, and many women received priesthood blessings promising that they would have the gift of healing. Currently, the Church's Handbook 2, Administering to the Church, directs that only Melchizedek priesthood holders may administer to the sick or the afflicted. Whitney recalled, I was also ordained and set apart under the hand of Joseph Smith the prophet to administer to the sick and to comfort the sorrowful. Several other sisters were also ordained and set apart to administer in these holy ordinances. Fragments of the long papyrus scrolls, once in Joseph Smith's possession, exist today. The relationship between those fragments and the text we have today is largely a matter of conjecture. The relationship of the translation manuscripts to the Book of Abraham is not fully understood. Neither the rules nor the translations in the grammar book correspond to those recognized by Egyptologists today. None of the characters on the papyrus fragments mentioned Abraham's name or any of the events recorded in the Book of Abraham. Mormon and non-Mormon Egyptologists agree that the characters on the fragments do not match the translation given in the Book of Abraham. Scholars have identified the papyrus fragments as part of the standard funerary texts that were deposited with mummified bodies. These fragments date to between the 3rd century BC and the 1st century CE, long after Abraham lived. At the Latter-day Saint settlement of Far West, some leaders and members organized a parliamentary group known as the Danites whose objective was to defend the community against dissident and excommunicated Latter-day Saints, as well as other Missourians. Historians generally concur that Joseph Smith approved of the Danites, but that he was probably not briefed on all of their plans, and likely did not sanction the full range of their activities. Danites intimidated church dissenters and other Missourians. For instance, they warned some dissenters to leave Caldwell County. 
During the fall of 1838, as tensions escalated during what is now known as the Mormon-Missouri War, the Danites were apparently absorbed into militias largely composed of Latter-day Saints. These militias clashed with their Missouri opponents, leading to a few fatalities on both sides. In addition, Mormon vigilantes, including many Danites, raided two towns believed to be centers of anti-Mormon activity, burning homes and stealing goods. Latter-day Saints mistreated and killed Indians in numerous conflicts, forcing them off desirable lands and onto reservations. In late 1849, tensions between Ute Indians and Mormons in Utah Valley escalated after a Mormon killed a Ute known as Old Bishop, whom he accused of stealing his shirt. The Mormon and two associates then hid the victim's body in the Provo River. Governor Young authorized a campaign against the Utes. A series of battles in February 1850 resulted in the deaths of dozens of Utes and one Mormon. In these instances and others, some Latter-day Saints committed excessive violence against Native peoples. Contemporaneous sources indicate that the number of Indians who died was between 24 and 40, though much later reminiscence places the death count among the Utes at around 100. Drawing on biblical passages, particularly from the Old Testament, Leaders taught that some sins were so serious that the perpetrator's blood would have to be shed in order to receive forgiveness. Such preaching led to increased strain between the Latter-day Saints and the relatively few non-Mormons in Utah, including federally appointed officials. Intemperate preaching about outsiders by Brigham Young, George A. Smith, and other leaders contributed to a climate of hostility. Some Latter-day Saints perpetrated acts of extra-legal violence especially in the 1850s, when fear and tensions were prevalent in the Utah Territory. The heated rhetoric of church leaders directed towards dissenters may have led these Mormons to believe that such actions were justified. In early September 1857, a branch of the territorial militia in southern Utah, composed entirely of Mormons, along with some Indians they recruited, laid siege to a wagon train of immigrants traveling from Arkansas to California. Isaac C. Haight, a state president and militia leader, sent John D. Lee, a militia major, to lead the attack on an immigrant company. Over the next few days, events escalated, and Mormon militiamen planned and carried out a deliberate massacre. They lured the immigrants from their circled wagons with a false flag of truce, and aided by Paiute Indians they had recruited, slaughtered them. Between the first attack and the final slaughter, the massacre destroyed the lives of 120 men, women, and children in a valley known as Mountain Meadows. Only small children, those believed to be too young to be able to tell what had happened, were spared. The militiamen sought to cover up the crime by placing the entire blame on local Paiutes, some of whom were also members of the church. 